it's a wet day here at Kyle Moore. So I hope where you are is a little bit sunnier or perhaps a little bit warmer. I was just saying to Barry, we had to turn on the heat in the middle of July in Kyle Moore. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us again for our uh, fourth and final installment of our inaugural uh, book club. I hope you've enjoyed the experience thus far and that you found it as enriching as uh, we all have. As you know, we initially started this book club, we thought that the theme of literature and film and lockdown would be the first theme we tackled as part of this book club community. We're absolutely planning on continuing this program during the academic year and we'll be announcing subsequent themes through the Think ND platform. So in the meantime, we invite you to stay engaged and continue learning through Think ND. There are many events and programs that our campus partners will be offering in the weeks and months to follow. But today is not the last of the Kyle Moore Book Club. Um, I want to again thank our co-sponsors because it really could not have been possible if we didn't have the collaborative efforts of these sponsors that joined us on this endeavor. Uh, in particular, I want to thank Notre Dame International, the Keough Nocton Institute for Irish Studies, the College of Arts and Letters, the Keough Global School, and the Notre Dame Learning, and the Notre Dame Alumni Association. Barry and I have really enjoyed working so closely with the core team these last two months, and we are so grateful to each of the members of the team. And we are already looking forward to reassembling them together for our next season of programming. Okay, this week, uh, we have the opportunity to discuss Albert Camus' The Plague. Camus, a Nobel Prize winning author, wrote this novel in 1947. He himself had no firsthand experience of enduring a plague, and yet reading it today, it has so many striking similarities to our current condition. I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have going back to rereading it. As our tradition is with each of these uh, sessions in the book club, um, we will have a 10 minute breakout session after Barry gives us his lecture, today's lecture, so that you can continue to meet uh, another person in the book club and discuss this book um, in the smaller group format. Should you not wish to join the smaller group format, then you do not need to go into the breakout room and you can stay in the main, main room and wait till we be assembled. We also ask that if you have questions for Barry, that you please use, please use the Google form that we are sharing with you now. This Google form helps us to facilitate the questions that you feed us as quickly and as effectively as possible. They are arranged to theme so that we can um, address them in like with like. So please, please use the Google form that's being shared with you now. Again, uh, as with every session, we seem to have so many questions. And so we will try our hard to, to get to all of them in the time constraint that we have. But if we don't get to your questions or comments, I want to redirect you back to our privately moderated discussion board on LinkedIn. And that's um, where you can continue the discussion. I, today I want to thank uh, Rosemary Dumont, who has posted to us in the last 24 hours two articles that she found uh, concerning the Decameron and the plague on LinkedIn. So I highly recommend you going to the discussion board to see those the links to those articles. Um, as you may know, um, we have promoted this event, the, the whole session, um, with the pre-recorded videos and lectures that we posted on Think ND, where Barry has discussed the few things from the book. For those of you who have not had the ch chance to watch these videos, I do recommend that you go back to Think ND and watch them. It's not imperative that you have had to watch them today. The, the, the lecture that Barry will give us now will be able to facilitate our discussion. So after that preamble, I wanna thank uh, Barry as always uh, for, for deciding to do this with us. And um, I would like to introduce Barry um, who's going to introduce the topic uh, live today. Uh, and um, I really feel this town of Oran could be Dublin or Clifton or um, South Bend. So thank you for 
suggesting this as part of lockdown, our literature and film in lockdown. Barry. Hi, everybody. Um, my connection seems to be coming and going. So just, is it OK? Um, Lisa, am I OK? OK, good. Yeah, you can hear me. Um, OK, so if it goes, just give me a sign. So I'm, I'm sad that this is our last meeting. Uh, and I'm, but I'm glad that we're ending with this text because it's one that brings together a lot of the things we've been talking about over the past uh, month. As I said at the beginning, you know, my belief is that literature isn't really something that gives us very immediate knowledge, usually in extreme situations. Usually I think of literature as something that teaches us about ordinary life more than about extreme situations. But this novel seems to be an exception. And that might be because it's a novel that shows how ordinary life becomes more visible, how we have a heightened sense of ordinary life in extreme situations. It's a novel that people have reached for, for advice, comfort, wisdom over the years in many different situations, including after the tsunami in Japan, for example, there was a, there was a boom in it, and in a number of different situations. But I think no generation, who so was written in the late 1940s, no generation will have read this book the way we have. As Lisa said, there's something extraordinary in the way Camus, who never lived through a, an epidemic, a pandemic himself, it's something extraordinary in the way in which he's able to imagine what that feels like. So up until now, people have understood this novel as being usually an allegory for the human condition, that what Camus, Camus calls a plague, but he uses, as a, as a, he uses the plague as a predicament to highlight something that is just true about life anyway, which is that it comes to an end. That's what the existentialists, the existentialists, which is the group of philosophers that Camus is connected to, they consider that the absurdity of the human condition, that life just comes to an end. All our striving, whatever we want, whatever we're looking for, comes to an end. And for him, the plague was a way to think about this, uh, let's say, sobering fact. However, for us who have lived through a global pandemic and quarantine, the book takes on a very different charge. We read it very differently. The progress of the plague, especially, I think is something, the way it starts, the way, the way things start to change gradually, is something that we can all relate to viscerally. The way what we have is something happening out of the ordinary. In this case, it's the dead rats appearing. Um, and this becomes more and more extraordinary until the extraordinary suddenly flips and becomes the new ordinary. Then we have this long, long life in the new ordinary in which the old, our old life, the, the people's old life has been forgotten. They no longer remember what life was like before the plague. And then we have the quite difficult transition back from the extraordinary situation of the plague, which was the new ordinary, back to the old life. So some of our themes from this month come up again and again. Um, in this in this novel. One of them is the inability caused by living in a pandemic to look at the future, to envision oneself in the future. And the, one of the questions that this novel asks is, who are we if we are not projecting ourselves into the future? Who are we if we are not thinking about our plans and ambitions? If you take plans and ambitions and the future away from human beings, what's left? It also asks a question, who are we when we are separated from our loved ones, when we, we can no longer think of ourselves, in other words, in the, our normal context, when our plans are interrupted? So the whole novel, in a way, is about the relationship between the ordinary and the extraordinary, between the exceptional and the non-exceptional. So we have, as I said, an extraordinary situation, which is the beginning of the plague, that turns into an ordinary one, a new ordinary. And by the same token, the novel, in the end, has an idea of heroism, which is not about exceptionality, but about ordinariness. The real heroes in this book are people who decide not to be extraordinary, not to stand out from the crowd, but to be ordinary, to just do their jobs, to just be. I think this is one of the lessons that we can all take from it. Sorry, the, can I, I just I need to check my connection. Is it okay? Yeah, you're okay. Okay, okay. So what we have in this novel is a series of characters and their ambitions. And their, their ambitions are all, are all different. One of them wants to write a book. He's still stuck on the first sentence. 
One of them wants to get back to Paris to join his girlfriend. All of these different plans and ambitions, all of them are interrupted. So that the question, the novel asks the question, what happens to us when we can't, uh, when our plans are interrupted and we can't project ourselves into the future? What we have in the end is, if we're going to take any advice from it, for, for, for us who've lived through a pandemic, I think it's that we have to try and experience this collectively. That something that the, the uh, global pandemic does is makes us realize how ordinary we are, that none of us are exceptions. And that the way we're, we will get through it, the best way to get through it, is to understand our experience as being one shared by others. Something else is perhaps a troubling part of the novel is that it suggests at the end that coming out of lockdown is not that easy. Where we expect there is the, there are parties and jubilation on the streets, but the novel in many different ways at the end suggests that it's maybe even harder to come out of lockdown than it is to get, in to, than it is to get into it. The people in the novel have internalized a new way of living, a new set of rules, a new set of ways of um, relating to each other. They've figured out who they are in some ways when they're disconnected from their usual plans and connections and ambitions in the future. And to move back to an ordinary life after that isn't easy. In fact, there's a character in the novel who finds, finally finds sanity and peace during the pandemic, during the lockdown. And he finds it very difficult to return to ordinary life. So I think these are, it's also a warning. But most of all, I think the novel suggests for us on a more hopeful note, that there is something we can learn for it. Obviously, we would not wish a pandemic on anybody. We all wish it hadn't happened. But since we're in it, we have to think about, well, what is it that we might be able to learn from it? And this is where I think Camus' novel can be very helpful in, in for us in trying to get something to glean some wisdom from this difficult experience we've all had. And I suppose it's this, as I, I've said already, that the experience of a pandemic, the experience of not know of, of the world being full of danger and, and of um, there being an unknown um, limit to our plans and ambitions out there, there are, our plans and ambitions are always going to hit a limit. Knowing that it's just a heightened experience of what real life is and that if, this experience reminds us that in the end, we are not beings in the future, we are beings in the present. We have to hold on to where we are now, to the people who are around us immediately and draw meaning from that. Not from thinking about where I'm going to be in two years time, uh, what it'll be like when I get back to Paris to be with my girlfriend, all of those things. We are where we are now. And in that way, Oran, the city of Oran, in a way is just a symbol for the here and now, which is what, the heroes in this novel return to. So we're used to novels, or not just novels, but literature in which heroes are people who travel, who go off on, on, on great ambitious voyages or military campaigns. Here the heroes are those who stay put, who accept the limits of where they are, accept the limits of the present and of the place that they're in right now. So I won't say any more today because it's our last day. I'd like to, you to have a little, um, to have plenty of time in your groups. Um, so we're going to put you into groups now. So just for anybody who's new, I'll go through the, what well, we call the rules, but they're more, more nudges. Um, so when you get into your groups, uh, first of all, be very kind and uh, friendly to each other. Uh, second of all, what we'd like you to do is first of all, introduce yourselves quickly um, say who you are, uh, where you are, something about why you, 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 what you've got from this course. Then you can talk about the novel together. And then we would like, oh, then pick a group leader, I beg your pardon, that's very important. Pick a group leader who will transmit your questions uh, to the link that you'll get in a moment. And we'd like you to talk about two questions. Um, first of all, any questions you have still, any thoughts or queries you have about Camus' novel, The Plague? And second of all, any questions you have about the course as a whole, any questions you, you still have remaining uh, from the last four weeks? Um, okay, so see you when you come back from your rooms. Great. I hope you enjoyed the session. And um, thank you for participating in the group discussion. So just want to remind you that in the chat function, there's the link to the Google form. So you can send us all your questions and then it'll be fed to me live. Um, so I am going um, to start with, um, let's see if Barry... If Barry's with me now too. Barry, you with me? 
Or did we lose Barry on the, on the way zooming in and out? We might have lost him on his Zoom, on, uh, in the cyberspace that it is of the zooming in and zooming out. Well, this week I'm more prepared than I was last week, just so you know. <laughs> I can talk way more about Camus than I would. <laughs> um, so I will start then, and, and then we'll see when Barry comes comes in because there's some great questions that came through. And um, when you think of the um, the similarities, I think is the is, is what strikes us the most. I think with when you see the descriptions of Oren. And I think when you're looking at the difference, wherever we are in the globe, there's so many similarities that we've experienced. And one of the questions that had come in was about um, relating the five part book to um, Kubler Ross's five stages of grief, which actually does resonate when you think of the beginning of the novel and where the rat's appearances appear there's this denial right we see all these rats they're they're in front and there's this this denial amongst um the porter uh, it's actually the porter that actually comes up first and and brings it to rio's attention um and then and then you have the, then you have anger you see the anger and this kind of anger that's happening in the in the novel uh, and the characters around it. And especially after the preachers, um, as, especially after the, the, the priest speaks and that I see Barry's back. So I'm gonna, I, I'm just addressing one of the first questions, Barry, and it's from um, Roberta, who was talking about relating the, the, the five part book of Camus book to the five stages of Kruber Ross's uh, stages of grief. And I was just wondering if you wanted to talk. I started off with, you know, the the denial, anger, uh, and then there's this bargaining, depression, and then acceptance of it all is what you see in the five parts. Do you do you see the similarities as well? One very important. Can you hear me? Okay. I, I think one very important thing, which is true about the stages of grief too, um, is that they don't always go in the same order for everybody, and I think. Um, one thing that is very relevant in, in Camus' novel for our situation is the fact that everybody's experience of pandemic is different. There are many similarities. In fact, most of us go, I think we probably all go through the same stages. Um, people have downs and ups and moments of optimism, moments of denial, moments of fear, but we don't all go through them at the same time. And this is actually one of the ways in which we could be uh, we can find to be kind to each other, I think, in this, is to remember that everybody's timing is different. Everybody go is, is going through the experience of this thing with a different psychological timing. And, and so it's one of the things that makes it hard to share, of course, the experience, because... <clears throat> I think you're back, Barry. Okay, we've lost him again, even though I can see him on the screen. Okay, well, I'll, I'll move, I'll move from, from the experience um, of the five stages of grief, but I think I, I would, I would think that with with the rats, the fires and the wind, you do see this kind of, um, this, this, this growing indifference then to um, it with the population, like the population is first full of, of, of denial, but then it's compounded by the indifference of the authorities, right? That you, you, you see them kind of collectively get it, gathering together about the, 
uh, oh, you know, we'll get, we'll get through this, we'll get over it. There's this, this collective indifference that the authorities have and this denial causes a lack of action, which I think you can see remnants of this in our own uh, governments and states where we had this lack of action at the very onset of our own um, dealings with the COVID. And it's only until like you see the problem of the rats accumulate that you see this painfully slow acknowledgement of, of that, that there is a problem. And it's, it's kind of like us tallying the, you know, every day we get obsessed with the, the news reports and the tallying of, 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 uh, of, of what we're seeing it happening in our hospitals. So I, I do think the, the, the rats are a very interesting metaphor to begin with, uh, especially in, um, in, the, in the context of, um, of, of, of what we're seeing in the pandemic. One of the questions that I was going to talk about with with Barry that I was I'm just going to form it here and then we'll we'll, we'll we'll restate it. But it's it was Father Panlow's sermon I thought was fascinating, and you know there's a there's a sort of hopelessness and panic that reigns as afterwards if you if you see that in the in the book and some of the people of Oran feel as if they were sentenced. To an unknown crime um, after the sermon, and I think there's an, a, there's a sense of the injustice this makes, uh, where some of us become passive and we let this happen, or but then there's also this sense of rebellion within the with, within the population, and the sense of injustice, however, is based on an expectation that justice exists somewhere. Uh, there's this belief in an underlying justice is somehow similar to our character, the Grand's belief in the existence of the right words, this obsession that the Grand has with, with which I think is a fascinating character who, who completely obsesses over the right words to be using. And I think there's a parallel there that we can come into, but I think Camus seems to suggest that the perfect justice or the perfect language are both impossibilities and appealing to them does not does more harm than good in trying to achieve the impossible such as Grand is doing with trying to achieve um, a perfect sentence he's unable to do this and so it, it, in trying to characterize the plague as God's justice Father Panlo makes matters worse rather than better in a lot of ways um, I'd say, can I just, Lisa, just add one thing to that, which is also, I think he's suggesting that uh, as well, that life is more, is about endless beginnings, um, that everybody has these ends they want, ends in the double sense of the, where they, purposes, you know, or places they want to go, but in fact, everything is really a, a beginning in a sense, because death comes to everybody sooner or later, there is no way, um, there is no way out of it. So I think that's part of also the rewriting of the first sentence, and you know, trying to get it perfect, there's no, there's, there's no sense in it in, in, in this world and trying to get everything perfect, you know. Sorry to interrupt, I just wanted to add that a little bit before you went on. No, no, thank you. I have another question then while we're with Grand, because um, we get this from um, Scott Small from South Bend, is what analogy is served through the character of Joseph Grand, in part, like, his obsession of, of, with the right words, but then also his inaction with improving his own life given his, his, his experience? I think I would go back to the earlier question about the stages of grief again and say, you know, that everybody, they all, this book is full of different impulses and responses and uh, everybody has them at different times. So you mentioned Father Panelou's sermon, that's one effort to make sense of it, but it doesn't have, so uh, there are other moments and other characters are trying to make sense of it, other moments when people accept the senselessness of it, moments when people struggle against it, moments when people accept it. And so they're all going through these experiences, but not, not having them at the same time. And I think then in um, this, the, this character's attempt to find the perfect sentence over and over again, it's sort of almost, it's almost a metaphor for people who think that life is something that is perfectible, that you can have the perfect life, that will have the perfect shape where everything all your plans and all your ambitions will fall exactly into place. And that's a fantasy. That's, that's, that's something that isn't true. And it's something that the pandemic makes very clear that the, our, our, our desire to have a perfected life, a life where all our plans come to fruition exactly as we want, that is, uh, it's not just a fantasy, it's also a foolish one. 
Um, Barry, uh, you mentioned in one of your lectures like about, about how the novel is dominated by male characters and like that kind of there's a very significant male presence throughout the novel like even the Ruru is the center of these male relationships that he has. Um, you know, women in the novel seem to have to be more of a specter than actually driving the plot. What, what would you, how would you comment about um, the role of women in the novel? I mean, I suppose I'd be lying if I, you know, to try and save it him too much, uh, you know, I, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a problem, that it's something disappointing in the novel. I would, it would be a richer novel if we had some of the, uh, women's experiences. Um, as it is, we have the mother uh, and the sick wife and the girlfriend in Paris. So they are uh, people on the edges of the novel. They represent, they sort of, they represent things rather than being actual characters who engage, engage in actions. So they represent especially loved ones, a separation from loved ones. That that's, seems to be the role of women in the novel. But I wonder, is it also because it's a novel that's so much about the question of ambition and about the futility of ambition? And that might also be why it focuses on, on these extremely ambitious men who are fixated on their careers and uh, you know, their, their plans and ambitions. That, that, that might be another reason. Uh, for that reason, in fact, it might have been interesting to have a counterpoint from people who were, you know, such as women or perhaps people from a different social class who are living a different kind of life from those men that we see. But it is, I mean, I, you know, I do have to say it's also a product of this time. There's no, no two ways about it. Um, I guess following on from that though, because there's, at the end of the novel, there's those who are reunited with those who they, you know, love and those who are, who are not. What would you say that this novel is saying about love? I think it's a novel that, uh, is less interested in romantic love and much more interested in a, a kind of um, less exciting and initially less rewarding love, which is just the love for one's fellow humans. Um, and especially not people that you choose, uh, but people that you end up with. And in fact, the novel in a lot of ways, um, it's a good corrective to us in the, in the early 21st century. Um, because it's very suspicious of choice and desire and will. That the idea that we should choose the people we love, we should choose the kind of careers we want to have, choose where we want to be. The novel is, is very suspicious of that. It's more interested in accepting where you are, who's next to you, who's close by, and, 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 and building upon that. So in that sense, it's a novel that isn't really so interested in, in romantic love, um, or even in passionate friendship, more interested in what we might call solidarity. So one of these questions is, um, we keep saying, thank goodness for technology to keep in touch with family and friends. And we are, you know, in the current crisis, we, we learned the, la the latest information on how to stay connected. Um, how, how would like the novel, I suppose, or, or learning from other pandemics, um, you know, how did how did people stay in touch with family? And and they're saying, you know, in some ways, were they better not off being bombarded with the news every day? Like, is is news so important to be so immediate? Well, one of the things that strikes me about the novel that probably strikes a lot of you is. Um, that there's this moment where everybody's obsessed with the statistics and the news. And they, it's one of the moments in which characters are trying to make sense of what's happening to them. So, so characters have different modes or different ways of trying to make sense of it. So Father Pan Lu uses religion, it's his, his way. Um, but there's also the news and statistics and people think, well, if I read, if I keep up completely up to date, maybe I'll understand what's happening. Then there's another moment, a later moment, when people take a step back and just kind of let things happen. And that seems to me at the core of the novels, um, the experience a novel is interested in. When you're not trying to control things or trying to understand things, but just experiencing them. That's, 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 that's how I understand the part about the news. Um, as for keeping in touch, again, the novel is interested in the relationships we make with the people who are close by that um, after a while, 
I mean, a lot of people mentioned during to me during the pandemic that they got zoomed out after a while, that after a while, Zoom just didn't hack it anymore. People wanted a face to face conversation with somebody, with anybody. And the novel is also is particularly puts a lot of value on that, on the relationships you build with people who are close by, who just happen to be there that you don't choose, that you don't even particularly like necessarily, but that are just sharing the same experience as you or in the same condition as you. So I guess following that up with experience, because when the beginning of the novel, the Orin is full of activity, like the people are, you know, living, they're working, they're living, they're loving, they're dying, they become matter, uh, like habit has become, um, just become matters of habit, like it's, and this kind of reminds me of um, David Foster Wallace's um, a uh, little uh, speech that he spoke uh, at when he gave a commencement address about one fish turning to the other fish saying, you know, how's the water? And he says, what water? Like the other fish says. So there's something about the mundane in this that, it, you know, and then the absurdity of it all. I was wondering if you could talk to Camus kind of um, highlights of the, of the commonality or this kind of how we, how our day-to-day -day existence is, is quite absurd. And even in the novel, you see its absurdity. Well, so the characters that start off so different from one another um, slowly become more and more similar as the novel goes on, that the experience of the, of the plague is so overwhelming that everybody's routines and habits and ambitions, I know I keep coming back to the word ambition, but I think the novel is really We lost him again. Oh, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah. So the, the experience of the pandemic uh, flattens them fl flattens them out. And I think Camus, one of the things he's saying is that that is the experience of life itself, that it's not just the experience of a pandemic, but that we see it more clearly in a pandemic, that our common humanity. So the common humanity is a horrifying thing at the beginning of a plague, as we saw that in the Decameron and other ones, because as human beings, we can infect each other, we can make each other ill, so we have to be afraid of each other. But in Camus' novel, we also see the flip side of that, which is that we are in the same boat, and so pandemic or no pandemic, we're in the same boat. It's just that being in the experience of a plague makes our common humanity, the links we have with each other, much, much clearer. This is one of the ways in which we might think that after our current experience, there might be political change of some kind, uh, that something about what connects us as human beings, what makes us the same rather than different, uh, is becomes much clearer and it becomes suddenly starkly clear in a pandemic situation. And this is one of the reasons I think that plagues often lead to big political changes, social, economic and political changes, because the links between human beings become uh, suddenly unavoidable. They go unavoidably visible. You can't really deny them. Um. I guess following on from that comment, um, Kathleen Lewis um, asks, the plague has very visual, viscerally upsetting symptoms on both humans and rats, whereas coronavirus symptoms are more internal and people might show no symptoms at all. Do you think the more steadily st um, st invisible spread of the coronavirus would change the nature of Camus' story? I don't think so, um, because uh, at the end of the novel, this very um, striking passage at the end of the novel, the, what, what Rio is thinking is that plagues are always there. They're always hiding somewhere in wait. And there he doesn't just mean a literal plague, a disease that's going to come, but that really the fact that the future is unknowable, the future is invisible, and we really don't know what's lying in store for us. So we should really do our best with, with the present, with what we have right now in front of us. Not keep trying to rewrite the, find the perfect first line of our novel or whatever it is. Well, to, I like that you, because Grand is a character that you, you obs I feel like as a, a reader obsessed with, um, because it's calling the, the attention to telling a story. And we saw that in Decameron, right? Of, of the young people, the impulse to tell a story. 
right? There's this need to tell a story as a way of coping with the trauma or the suffering that we're in, in experiencing. Um, so, so, you know, it's so important to tell stories because it's a way of coping, a coping mechanism. With regards to the dramatic structure of the, narr of the, of the narration of the novel, though, Barry, and, and as a novelist yourself, why is um, the narrator unnamed in the beginning? What's the, what's the tool that they're using? And, and, and why then reveal at the end that it's real? Well, that's a great question. Um, that's a great question. I suppose it's, the, 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 I mean, there's a, two things I want. First, to, to, just to go back to the writer, you know, his name is Joseph Grand. And Grand in French, as you know, means great or big. And there's something about the grandiosity of his ambition that is, um, that is being parodied there, that he wants to be a great writer. And what he wants to do is capture this glorious moment in the past, you know, this, um, where the, the, the people go by in the, in the park, the women walk go by in the park. He wants to capture this moment absolutely perfectly. Uh, and then, you know, the novel, it's, it's, it's a, a kind of a, a, kind of a mean sort of parody of that, that, that kind of ambition. But by the same token then, why is our narrator anonymous? Because I think the novel is saying that we, we don't have, it, it's, it, it's wrong to think of people in terms of exceptions as heroes. Nobody is grand or great. Every man is the same as no man. It's the same as an exceptional man. So our narrator could be anybody and it happens to be one person inside it. So it's emphasizing the fact that this is a, an experience that happened to everybody, that anybody could narrate, that anybody could be the protagonist or the hero. I think that, that's how I understand it anyway. Okay, so another question we have is, considering one of the main questions that Barry proposes, what happens when we can't project ourselves into the future? Father Panlo seems to be a very dismal character who seems to preach that the lack of a future is the fault of the people who have turned their face from God. What role does Panel play in the main themes? Well, I, I mean, it's safe to say that this is not um, a novel that is enthusiastic about uh, religion. I think that's um, I think that's a fairly safe way to put it. That it again because it's a it's a form of thought that is this is for what Camus thinks that is so oriented towards the future and towards delayed rewards and delayed gratification. And I think a bit like the, the, the novelist who wants to be, you know, Joseph Grand, who wants to be the great novelist, the novel is suspicious of anything that places meaning in the future, in, 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 the, in the what is yet to come. That uh, the, the novel looks for meaning in the present. And it thinks of the, the predicament of a pandemic as a way to see that clearly that the future is unknown, uh, rewards are unknown, and that the meaning, of humanity, the meaning of a human life is not in what it plans to do, how great it's going to be, how exceptional it's going to be, but what it is now and what it is building with what, is, with what and whom is around it right, right, right at that moment, right in the present. I don't know if this is a fair Not a Catholic question. novel in that sense, we have to say. He does do it. The panel does have a transition of character when he, he partakes in the actual helping of the sanitary squad. And, and um, sorry, let me tell you right, Lisa. Let me just add about that. That for can you, that's what religion is important for. Is actually the doing of good works, actual um, concrete helping of people in the present. You know, I think it's the kind of Catholicism that the current Pope might might 